Fire Stone Cold! The Hellraiser is back! Here we go! Evolution of the Shield! John Cena versus the Show! Stop her! Hulk Hogan and The Rock in the same ring! You will never take my place at the head of the table! Undertaker! On the Hell's Gate submission! Oh my god! What? My god, Michaels! Just kick Cena's head off! Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome back to WWE Retro on the WWE Podcast on this Friday, July 8th, as we are finally on the road to SummerSlam this year. Money in the Bank is in the rearview mirror, and for the first time in what feels like forever... We have SummerSlam in July. I've always been accustomed to it being in the middle or towards the end of August, but WWE clearly switching up their plans this year and having it a bit earlier in the summer. I don't completely hate it, although I'm curious to see how the rest of the pay-per-views will fare if there will be one in August. If you remember a few years ago, I think it was uh, was a Backlash or when Roman Reigns returned and attacked uh, The Fiend and uh, Braun Strowman to win the Universal Championship. I believe it was at a pay-per-view like a week or two directly after SummerSlam. But obviously, we're not here to talk about pay-per-views. We are here to talk about a retro event. And today, we are here to talk about John Cena's rise to the main event. And obviously, that's a bit subjective, but uh, just to kind of hammer out some parameters, I'm going to be talking about from when he entered the WWE right up until his first WWE Championship victory at WrestleMania 21 in 2005, and how John Cena really rose to the main event status and became arguably the greatest superstar we've ever seen in the history of the company. Obviously, completely subjective whether or not you think John Cena is there or not. I would not have him there, but he is 100% on my Mount Rushmore because of what he's meant to the business. And, um, you know, he was never one of my favorites. I was never, like, a huge John Cena fan by any stretch. But I still, to this day, think that his impact on the business is almost unparalleled because... I think that when he came in, he kind of took over the lead role in the company during a very vulnerable time, at a time where the company was desperately searching for that next, quote, big guy, the next face that runs the place. And he came in and really took that ball and ran with it for pretty much a decade or so, uncontested. Obviously, was that all for the good of WWE? You would probably make the case otherwise. But nevertheless, it's hard to argue what John Cena meant to the business. And I guess you could start off by how he showed up in the business. And obviously, the first time we ever saw John Cena on WWE television was June 27th, 2002, where he interrupted Kurt Angle, slapped him in the face, he possessed ruthless aggression, all that. And the first five to six months or so for John Cena were not very successful, And there were talks about him being released. You know, a very vanilla guy, wasn't getting over much. And as we know, he finally got the attention of WWE management, and more specifically, then general manager of SmackDown, Stephanie McMahon, when he was rapping on a plane. And she thought he was very good. Obviously, he was. And it catapulted John Cena into the main event. Or, not into the main event, rather, but it catapulted him into the uh, mainstay on SmackDown. And it's weird because we always remember the back to the Doctor of Thugonomics, John Cena, when he was really kind of the mid-card babyface US champion over on SmackDown. But there was a time long before that, in early 2003, where John Cena had Bull Buchanan with him, And you had a very heel and smug John Cena. Me and B2, who are you raging? 
So that's just kind of a sneak preview to what we would see from John Cena as a heel. And this is basically what we were accustomed to in the early years of John Cena post his initial initial debut. A guy who would come in, rap his whole theme song down to the ring, and had B2, aka Bull Buchanan, as his sidekick. And he had a series of matches with Brock Lesnar in early 2003. He had some matches with Eddie Guerrero, Rikishi, all that. But his big first ever program would come against none other than The Undertaker. That, which, you know, I think is kind of ironic when you look back. Because all these years later, all we wanted was for a John Cena versus Undertaker match at a WrestleMania. And little did we know that all those all these years prior, these two had actually fought and was arguably John Cena's first meaningful feud on the WWE main roster. And although it was at Vengeance 2003, it truly felt like a big time level fight. And 
So, big time push for John Cena here. Getting in a program with The Undertaker. And fun fact, Vengeance 2003 was the first ever brand exclusive pay-per-view. Uh, specifically for SmackDown. So this was a pretty big pay-per-view in the history uh, in this era of SmackDown. And uh, this is kind of when they started fast-tracking John Cena onto a path of significance and relevance. Because you just don't start having programs and matches with The Undertaker uh, for shits and giggles, for lack of better terms, pardon my language. And this is when you started really start when you started to really take John Cena seriously, and he would lose this match. But again, one of these situations where you're winning even in a loss, and a situation where John Cena was starting to be recognized as a true player on SmackDown, and I think that. For WWE, they needed this over on SmackDown because you had a lot of the old guard in Kurt Angle, in The Big Show, in The Undertaker, and obviously Brock Lesnar sitting at the top of the card. But beyond that, you know, Eddie Guerrero hadn't made his push yet. Chris Benoit was on the cusp of making his push, and they really needed new um, new talent to try and get push through. And John Cena obviously would stay on his upward trajectory leading out of 2003 and into 2004. But it wasn't until November of 2003, leading into Survivor Series uh, 2003, in the Kurt Angle versus Brock Lesnar 5-on-5 traditional elimination match, that we would get arguably the most significant moment in John Cena's trajectory towards the main event. Voice of the SmackDown generation, John Cena, I applaud you, sir. Cena, 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 I agree with each and every one of you because John Cena, that's what I like about you. What you want, you take. Like you took that victory from Rey Mysterio. But tonight, John, you don't have to take anything anymore because I'm going to give you something. It's not the United States Championship. You have to earn that like the big show. It's not the WWE title. You have to earn that like Brock Lesnar! But John, you did earn something and that is the privilege that I'm about to bestow upon you and it's the very first step in, in a glorious career for you, John, because with Brock's blessing, I hereby proclaim you, John Cena, the fifth and final member of Team Lesnar at Survivor Series! So the rumors, wow. the rumors are true! John Cena will be joining Lesnar's team at Survivor Series! Oh, General Manager said it! Chill, 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 chill. You're telling me that I'm member five of Team Lesnar for Survivor Series. I didn't stutter, did I? Oh, no. No, you didn't, but, uh... I got a problem with that. You see, nobody tells John Cena what to do. And besides, bro, look at your team, man. I ain't gonna fit in on Tegan Sasquatch. I mean, bro. Hey! I know how to wait a minute! So, John Cena gets, I guess, bestowed with the honor to join Team Lesnar along with um, Matt Morgan, Nathan Jones, The Big Show, and he declines. And in that moment, John Cena turned babyface and would effectively join Team Kurt Angle along with Chris Benoit, Bradshaw, and Hardcore Holly. And... 
John Cena joining Kurt Angle's team and being one of the sole survivors along with Chris Benoit was when you really knew something special was going on. And he ended the match by hitting the big show with an FU, which was absolutely insane. And him and Benoit are the lone survivors, or the, the two survivors left over, to secure the victory for Kurt Angle. And this is when John Cena, now on the babyface side of the card, really start get, started to get fast-tracked into a very significant role here. He comes down to one of the... Um, he came down to the end in the Royal Rumble 2004. He actually hurt his knee on the elimination that looked really, really gruesome. And then at No Way Out 2004, he's involved in the triple threat match along with the Big Show and Kurt Angle to determine the number one contender for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 20. Obviously, Kurt Angle would win that match and go on to face uh, Eddie Guerrero at uh, WrestleMania 20. But John Cena gets the honor to have a match for the United States Championship against the Big Show, a match that would open WrestleMania. And, you know, I've talked at length how much I've loved uh, WrestleMania 20 for how significant it was, the stars it had, the up-and-coming matches it had, the amount of championships that were defended. For me, bar none, a top three WrestleMania of all time, just an absolutely brilliant card up and down. But... What goes with a brilliant card is how you kick off the night. And John Cena opened WrestleMania 20. He was the first guy you saw when WrestleMania 20 went on the air. And obviously cuts a promo on the big show in Madison Square Garden wearing a Patrick Ewing Knicks jersey. And right off the bat had the crowd in his hand. And even in this video I just played, you heard that as even as a heel... The crowd was behind John Cena at this time as the doctor of thugonomics. And as the match went on and it came to a close, John Cena, even with heel tendencies, would secure his biggest victory to date. That which gives Big well, Show more leverage. That's right. The only leverage in the world is just a matter of time for the Big Show finish off John Cena. Nothing against John Cena. Tremendous athlete. The kid's got a great upside, but he's overmatched against the United States champ, the Big Show. John Cena back to both feet. John Cena flying oh. just oh. Oh. for the, a shot to the ribs of Big Show. Oh. Again, a right hand to the ribs of the Big oh. Show. And a third right hand. John oh. Cena trying to build momentum. He just got oh. hot, got hot, no doubt about it. Oh. Oh. A close line, Big Show wobbles. Big Show reeling again off the right hand. John Cena with a third right hand. And the kid from Massachusetts is going to battle back yeah. into this fight. He might have something here. Yeah. Got some haymakers. Got some out. Yeah, we'll show the haymakers. The right hand by John Cena. Here's the reversal. John Cena across the ring into the corner. Oh, oh. Shot to the jaw of Big Show. Could be an opening for Cena. Watch out, show. Be careful here. John Cena to the knees. John Cena went low. Needs to try to take the big man off his feet. Uh-oh. Look at this.
So John Cena, with the help of the Brass Knox, nails Big Show in the face, and after a second FU, secures his first ever U.S. and championship in WWE. And I, I thought this was great storytelling, where you had a babyface John Cena, but still up to the antics that got him over in the first place. And it's just so crazy to see John Cena have the crowd behind him in such a capacity. And uh, just an absolute great moment for John Cena. A fantastic way to kick off uh, WrestleMania 20. And they were off to the races in 2004 with John Cena in the uh, on SmackDown. And um, John Cena would have a very important 2004 he had a very, very significant program with Booker T in 2004, where it would ultimately culminate in a best of five that would start at SummerSlam 04 and end at No Mercy 2004. And I think that was something that really kind of propelled John Cena to, to an even higher level. Because going toe-to-toe with a veteran like Booker T, exchanging the United States Championship several times, it kind of showed that he could go with the best of them. And Booker T, by this point, in my opinion, was kind of like an elder statesman, had been in WWE for about three years, had been in professional wrestling for, I would want to say, almost 10 at this point, maybe a bit less. But uh, that program with Booker T is not talked about enough in my opinion, and he would trade the belt with Booker T a few times, and uh, it was actually vacated at one point leading into the Great American Bash 2004, but John Cena really hovered around that United States Championship scene for all of 2004, pretty much, even until the night after uh, his no, his best of five, his best of five series with Booker T would culminate at No Mercy, uh, he would drop the belt to a debuting Carlito, and uh, Carlito, much in the fa- much like the fashion John Cena won his first ever U.S. title, would use the chain to hit John Cena over the head and secure the U.S. championship. And then the storyline would come out that John Cena was stabbed in a club, and you know they they kind of made it they insinuate that it was Carlito and his henchman Jesus that were the culprits in doing so. And this would lead to a John Cena return at Survivor Series 2004 when he was fighting on behalf of Team Guerrero and Carlito was fighting on behalf of Team Angle. And John Cena's return at this Survivor Series was kind of when you knew, based on the crowd reaction, that you know what, this guy is destined for stardom. And uh, John Cena chases Carlito out of the building, and he would eventually regain the United States Championship at a later uh, fight between uh, himself and Carlito, but now you kind of knew it was a matter of time. You knew it was a matter of time before John Cena would find himself in the main event, and uh, at the Royal Rumble 2005, it comes down to him and the big show, or not the big show, Batista, And after a controversial finish, and Vince McMahon comes down to the ring and tears both of his quads trying to get in the ring, uh, Batista would win the Royal Rumble to go on to main event WrestleMania. But that's on the Raw side of things. And on the SmackDown side of things, you had to find a guy to become the number one contender for JBL's WWE Championship. And John Cena would win a tournament to gain that honor 
still as the United States champion. And John Cena winning this was really well received. I think he was the only choice by this point. And it became clear that on the road to WrestleMania 21, that this was the guy that the crowd was ready to get behind. And obviously JBL, who had been on a nine-month run as WWE champion, just the guy who really walked the line between true heel heat and borderline go-away heat, the crowd was ready for someone new. They were ready for someone fresh. And especially when he dropped the U.S. title to Orlando Jordan heading into WrestleMania 21, you got a feeling that this was finally going to be the time that WWE goes in a different direction and pulls the trigger on a brand new era for the WWE Championship. And when WrestleMania 21 came to be, it was time for John Cena to fulfill the prophecy. Frustration perhaps on his face as the champion looks to see what he has to do to put the challenger away. I mean, how many times has this JBL's unsuccessfully went for a pickup and not get the victory here? But look at JBL's up on the top. And up and he's up and There's the challenger off the scoop slayer. Catching JBL at a pure instinct in midair. I'll tell you what, that's usually not something you see JBL do. That's uncharacteristic of him. A big jumbo jet up there, but JBL, I'm sorry, John Cena does not have the wherewithal to get a cover on JBL. And John Cena take advantage here. There's been a number of points in the matchup, but Cena has had an opportunity, has had an opening, and Bradshaw has slammed the window shut. And there's an elbow. And Cena with the right hand. And again, watch the champion's life. And here comes Cena. He's bringing those punches. A nice head book there. The John Cena match line knocks the champion down. And a kid from West Newberry, Massachusetts is beginning to feel it here. So John Cena secures his first ever WWE Championship against John Pradshaw Layfield at WrestleMania 21 and thus completing his ascent and his arrival into the main event of WWE. And the only thing that kind of hurts this, in my opinion, is that I I really didn't think it was a good match. I remember in the moment being very underwhelmed, uh, just about 12 minutes And look, JBL obviously had his limitations in the ring. There's far worse matches than this, but I just, I don't know. I was not a uh, massive fan of the match itself, but uh, John Cena winning and the story to get here was obviously very, very um, well done. And someone had mentioned this to me a couple days, I believe about a week ago on Twitter. My fellow Canadian, Dan Knightley, Uh, so shout out to your Dan, if you're listening, that the build to WrestleMania 21 was probably the best in, of this era, I would say, not the best WrestleMania by any stretch of my opinion, I thought it was a very, 
satisfactory WrestleMania. Wasn't a fan that aside from the women's WWE and World Heavyweight Championships, there were no titles defended. Um, and in my opinion, I don't think there was enough gimmick matches. Obviously, the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match is a very significant one. But uh, I just didn't think uh, there was enough uh, special matches, if there were, if you would. But uh, the build to WrestleMania 21 was almost unparalleled. Obviously, with Cena going against JBL, Batista's babyface turn against Triple H, the Money in the Bank ladder match, the first ever to do so, uh, Taker versus Orton, HBK versus Angle. It was a very, very good build. And John Cena was an integral part of that because it really was kind of new school versus old school at this WrestleMania. Cena versus JBL and all the matches I just rattled off. It really was kind of like the two generations colliding against one another. And a lot of very high profile one-on-one matches, which obviously is what w- which is what WrestleMania is all about, right? Like I was talking about gimmick matches, but I'm probably just a sucker for that when you really get down to it. Mania is typically all about the high-profile one-on-one matches, and uh, WrestleMania 21 had that. So objectively, a very good WrestleMania. Subjectively, I didn't hate it, but I wasn't a massive fan of it. So take that for what it's worth. But what it did certainly accomplish was John Cena carving out his official spot in the main event, and he would stay there for just about 10 years or so. And the rest is history. And we know everything that John Cena has meant to this business. And whether you love him, whether you hate him, you cannot deny the impact he had on WWE on the later part of the Ruthless Aggression era and all of the PG era. And was it all great? No. Was it all must-watch television? Certainly not. Did they make some bad booking decisions along the way? Absolutely But I think that John Cena really kind of carried this company for a long time. And I would have liked to see what he could have done if he had been in the Ruthless Aggression era or even the Attitude era to see what a non-PG version of John Cena would have been. But at the same time, what he did with Make-A-Wish is something that I guess, at least for me personally, gives his never-turning-heel a pass. The, the non-heel turn for John Cena for me gets a pass because of what he did for Make-A-Wish and for all the lives he has changed. And you know what? We love wrestling. We love good storytelling. We love a good heel turn. But uh, what he's done for Make-A-Wish and making so many kids happy is paramount to my opinion. And it's something that um, I won't get into it, but it's something that really kind of hits home for me. It's something that is always kind of... Um, it's always kind of affected me in a very sentimental way. Um, and I think that uh, seeing John Cena all these years, what he's done for thousands or hundreds, rather, let's not get carried away, for hundreds of children to be their real life superhero is something that for me, look, again, I'm not a huge John Cena fan as a character. He was never a top five for me of all time or anything like that. But from an objective standpoint, the impact he's had on as many lives as he has, I think uh, I think it kind of supersedes everything he did in the ring. And just a really good dude by all accounts, and uh, a well-deserved 20 years of celebration of him in the ring. But I thought it was just very important to come on here and talk about how he got to the main event from early 2003 until early 2005. Well, anyway, guys, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed John Cena's rise to the main event. As always, you can get me on Twitter at Adamarco25. You can get Matt on Twitter at Wrestling underscore audio. Or you can email him each and every week for the WWE mailbag. Anyway, guys, I hope you're enjoying your summer. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash wwepodcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.